So we will continue our discussion of optimizations. And now we will we're looking into prefetching. <coughs> Okay, <coughs> so if we have uh, if we have access like this, if we have a uh, a loop that accesses an array uniformly, we can prefetch prefetch uh, uh, memory locations. What does prefetching mean? It means prefetching fetching them from main memory to L1 cache. And remember that the access time to L1 cache for L1 cache the access time is two to four cycles, typically. And the access time of main memory is hundreds of cycles. So if we are, if we have this array, this is A of zero, A of one, a of 2, and so on. Now the question is, uh, how, many, uh, how, many si how many iterations ahead should we uh, be, uh, be fetching? You know, for, for example, uh, in iteration number 2, or iteration 1, we will be accessing A of 1. Uh, now, when will we get to the next? Well, when will we have a page? Uh, when will we have a, uh, a cache miss? When you uh, go beyond the cache line. Yeah, exactly. So when you go beyond the cache line. So if you assume that this is a of 0, uh, if you assume that the cache line has 64 bytes or 64 bytes, let's say 16 elements, then A of 16 is going to miss in the cache in this case. Right. So when, when we get to A of 16, we, will, we are going to miss in the cache. What if we prefetch it ahead? So prefetching ahead, so we need to know uh, how much time it will take to this, for this loop to execute, right? How, many, how much time will it take to the body of the loop to execute? So if, uh, if the body of the loop is 100 cycles and memory access is 500, so it, uh, if the, the body of the loop takes 100 cycles to execute, and of course, at this point, the compiler will not know exactly how many cycles. So it will have to base this calculation into a rough estimate of the number of cycles needed to execute the body of the loop. And in fact, this is something that I worked on in the GCC compiler, the prefetcher. So in the prefetcher, uh, you have to have an estimate of the number of cycles. And this is going to be an approximate estimate. Because at this point, remember that this is an intermediate level optimization. We are not. We haven't gotten yet to code generation and optimization, so we don't even have actual instructions. We have IR, an intermediate representation. So we cannot, we don't have an accurate estimate of the number of cycles, but the compiler will calculate some approximation. So say it's, you know, roughly this loop will take uh, 
100 cycles. And it takes 500 cycles to bring something from main memory to cache. This means what? It means that you have to fetch in order to uh, in order to fetch a, a memory location and it is, and have it ready when you need it you have to fetch how many si how many loop iterations ahead so how many loop iterations so each iteration is 100 cycles and you need 500 cycles to to fetch it from main memory to uh, l1 cache so you will need five iterations yeah, so. so if you fetch five iterations ahead then by the time you you need that uh, uh, by the time you need that memory location it will be in uh, it will be in l1 cache hopefully so by by looking at an estimate of uh, the number of cycles needed to execute the loop and an estimate of the number of cycles needed to fetch something from memory. So if this is five times more, then you need to fetch five iterations ahead because each iteration is 100 cycles. And usually, you know, this calculation is not accurate, like I said, so it's something that you will need to experiment with in order to, you know, to optimize or to tune the performance of this uh, of this optimization pass uh, because nothing is known exactly by the way in in compiler optimizations the compiler makes lots of guesses so the compiler is allowed to guess when it comes to uh, optimizing performance but it's not allowed to guess when it comes to correctness so here uh, it has to make some guess it has to make some approximations and uh, approximate calculations and things like that and in fact when I first started working on the prefetcher in the GCC compiler the prefetching was degrading the performance of many programs how do you think prefetching would degrade the performance well, the CPU has to execute bus cycles to bring the yeah, yeah locks in the cache yes so if if you prefetch something and it's not useful you'll be wasting machine resources for nothing and uh, you know prefetching will not be useful if for example your loop body has nothing in it is very small because the whole point in doing prefetching is you send a request to the memory system to fetch something from main memory to the L1 cache while you are executing something inside the loop while the CPU is busy doing some useful work within the loop but if the loop has a nobody has a very small body it doesn't have a significant amount of CPU computation this will not prefetching will not buy you anything because if if you don't have enough CPU computation in the loop, your loop is doing memory anyway. All what it's doing is memory. The point in prefetching is overlapping uh, the time consuming fetching of memory locations from main memory to L1 cache, overlapping that with actual CPU computation. And if you don't have enough CPU computation, then prefetching is unlikely to be useful and you better not generate, you better not do any prefetching. Also, since prefetching, you are prefetching multiple iterations ahead, if the number of iterations of this loop is not large enough, you're not gonna benefit. You know, if we are prefetching uh, five iterations ahead and the loop is executed only three times, you're not gonna benefit. In fact, if, uh, if a loop is, executed a small number of times it's not an interesting loop anyway you know because whatever gets e executed inside that loop is not executed for uh, it's not executed frequently enough to affect performance so we are always in, in when we optimize performance 
uh, we're always more interested in the code that gets executed more frequently. The loop that is inside uh, uh, deeper loops and the, the loop that has higher frequencies of execution. Okay, so this is about uh, prefetching. Let's now talk about another compiler optimization. <laughs> but before we talk about this, let's Let's see the different scopes of compiler optimizations. Optimization scopes. So in our study of instruction scheduling and register allocation, we, we talked about the local scope. And local scope in the context of compilers means what? The, yeah, the local scope is within, usually within a basic block. Yeah, exactly. So this is within a basic block. And the global, and I'm give it number three because there is something in between, is global scope is operating on the whole procedure, a procedure or a function. So whole uh, procedure, or we call it intra-procedural. intra-procedural optimization where the optimization is global the compiler is optimizing a whole function at once but it's not looking at multiple functions there are some optimizations that are uh, inter-procedural so inter-procedural optimizations are optimizations that uh, that can span multiple functions, where the compiler is looking at multiple functions. And these are usually expensive and expensive optimizations, and they are turned on by, they are not turned on by default. So by default, they are off. You have to use a, an option or a command, a command line option or a flag to turn them on. And why do you think interprocedural optimizations are slow? Uh, because some optimizations are NP complete and they consider the entire program, which can be many thousands of instructions. That can take quite a while. Yeah. So it's, well, not, if it's NP complete, then the compiler may not terminate. The compiler may, if it's trying to solve an NP complete problem, optimally without any limits, the compiler may not uh, terminate. But some of the compiler optimization algorithms are uh, super uh, linear, like n squared. Even an n squared, if you apply n squared to uh, uh, a large number of instructions, that can take a long time. So what is, what is reasonable for n squared? You know, if, if you apply an n squared algorithm, how big should the input be uh, in order for the algorithm to complete uh, within reasonable time that you don't feel? So this is an easy calculation. It depends on how many operations can uh, a typical computer uh, execute within one second. So within one second, if, if you have a a one gigahertz computer that can do 10 power 9 cycles per second. 
But a cycle is not an operation. Operations usually take multiple cycles. So uh, most operations take multiple cycles, especially memory access operations that miss in the cache. They may take hundreds of cycles. So on average, assuming an average, assuming that on average, each operation takes, um, you know, let's say 10 cycles, which is optimistic, quite optimistic, then uh, the machine can do 10 power 8 operations per second. This is optimistic. Usually it's closer to 10, 10 power 7. Now if it does 10 operations per second, now n squared, if given an n squared algorithm, so if the input for if n equals 10 power 4, number of operations equals 10 power 8, which is what the computer can execute in one second. So 10,000, you can do 10,000 in a 10,000, an input size of 10,000. If your algorithm is n squared, you can do 10,000 within one second. So, but how many, uh, how many instructions or how many statements does a large program have? So a large program has more than 10,000 statements, more than 10,000 instructions. So in fact, you know, n squared are not, usually are not appropriate for uh, interprocedural optimizations, unless you are willing to wait for a long time. Uh, so usually for interprocedural optimizations, uh, you know, we would like the algorithms that are being used to be n, you know, linear or ne near linear. So n or n log n algorithms. But n squared uh, are not going to process uh, a large program uh, within reasonable time. OK. So we have local, global, interprocedural. And between local and global, we have regional scope. So sometimes. Sometimes the optimization may not work on the entire function, but it may divide the function into multiple regions, and each region has multiple basic blocks in it. So in fact, this is, uh, sometimes this is done with register allocation. If the function is too big, uh, the register allocator may divide the function into uh, multiple regions. Each region consists of multiple basic blocks. So this is something in between, you know, between a basic block and a whole function. It can, uh, some optimizations are, you know, operate on a region whose size is larger than a basic block, but smaller than a whole function. Okay. Questions on these concepts? What is the typical size of the basic block? Oh, a typical size of a basic block. So in fact, it, it varies widely, and it depends on the nature of the program. So how does it depend on the nature of the program? You know, what, what kinds of programs will have smaller basic blocks, and what kinds of programs will have larger basic blocks? Smaller basic blocks would be a lot of branching if yeah. If else loops and uh, a lot of conditional brain switch statements. Yeah, exactly. If your program has lots of if else and lots of switches yeah, and loops. Yeah, and loops, then your program will have uh, smaller basic blocks. Uh, on average, you know the programs will have. You know, I'm talking about uh, spec. 
CPU 2006 benchmarks, the benchmarks that are used for evaluating CPU performance. Uh, well, there are two kinds of uh, programs. There are programs that have lots of, uh, that are control intensive, control intensive programs with lots of if else. And there are programs, what's, what's the other kind of programs? What programs do not have lots of if else? Programs that have, a, that are largely linear, such as uh, very complicated mathematical expressions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, very long basic block. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So programs that are more scientific, uh, more scientific programs that do a lot of mathematical computations, they will not have lots of if else. They will have big mathematical formulas, big expressions, and those will have larger basic blocks. So in general, you know, scientific programs that are compute intensive have larger basic blocks, and Programs that are control intensive, lots of control if else, will have smaller basic blocks. Uh, but on average, you know, in uh, CPU 2006, there are integer benchmarks and there are floating point benchmarks. So floating point benchmarks are the benchmarks with that have scientific programs, uh, and integer are the programs that have uh, that are control intensive. And I think in both cases, the average basic block size is less than 10. Uh, this is off the top of my head. So this is my, these numbers are not exact, but it's uh, here that the, ba the, ba the average basic block size is uh, a few instructions. Here, it, I don't know it, if it's 10 or even less than 10, uh, something in, in, in that range. But this is bigger, the average is bigger. Well, it's not that big, so the average is it's not going to be you know 50 instructions okay so <clears throat> all right so this is uh, so let's talk about the most uh, the most common one of the most common uh, interprocedural optimizations which is function inlining So what's function inlining? So function inlining is an interprocedural optimization because it, I assume that some of you will be familiar with function inlining. What does it mean? Instead of, instead of executing a call statement inside the code, it'll, it'll uh, take a, a function and, and insert it into the instruction stream of where it's being yeah. executed at. Exactly, exactly. So if you have, you know, function f and function f calls function g and function g is you know a b c this is the code for function g so function inlining is simply replacing the call with the body of the function so you just put a b c This is function inlining. Okay. So what are the benefits of function inlining? Why do compilers do function inlining? Why is it useful? Why, why does it improve performance? <laughs> okay. Okay. I guess I'll go. Uh, function inlining because when you because on some architectures a call can uh, a call to a subroutine can be expensive especially because you're dealing with stack and everything mm -hmm. pushing and popping to and from the stack so a function inlining saves the call saves the procedure call overhead because it can and, and and there's a caching issue because then the code for that functions being called to has to be loaded into the cache whereas on this case if it's in line it'll continue it'll just continue mm -hmm. along the instruction stream and and, and the prefetcher inside the CPU okay. will keep the cache filled as long as it's sequential uh, 
Okay, well, what you are referring to is not, uh, uh, is not prefetching, you, it's, not, uh, uh, it's not caching, you're referring to branch prediction. Right. Uh, okay, uh, well, yeah, so it's, or, or in fact, for a function, it's a jump, it's not a conditional branch, it's going to be a yeah. jump. Uh, so, uh, okay, so that's an issue, but in, in fact, in terms of caching, it's, uh, 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 there are uh, disadvantages of doing inlining from caching point of view. Let's first, you know, look at the obvious advantages. The obvious advantage of doing function inlining is eliminating the function call overhead. You know, what is the function call overhead? Uh, all, everything that has to be done in order to call a function. There is a whole uh, protocol for calling a function uh, and uh, part of that protocol is pushing the, the values of the parameters on the stack. So by, by calling a function, the values of the parameters that are passed to the function are pushed uh, on the stack. And then we are jumping to the code. We are doing a jump to the code for that function. And then when we are done, we are returning. So there will be, uh, we will be jumping to a different piece of code. And that jump is, uh, is costly. So the, the cost of the jump, the cost of passing parameters uh, to, the, to the function, pushing them on the stack. Now, uh, uh, here, with, when we inline it, we no longer need that. So we eliminate the function call overhead. And that can, uh, can save us uh, a lot of time. Uh, well, another, uh, another uh, less clear advantage of function inlining is that when you do function inlining, you create more optimization opportunities. So when you inline a function, you can create more optimization opportunities because now uh, this becomes one piece of code. So an example is, for example, here, um, function f calls, say, x equals 5, and then it calls g, and in function g, uh, function g that gets the value of x, if x is greater than 100, uh, then do this code and return 1 else execute some other code and return 2. <coughs> so this is function g, but you know, you could have another function h that calls g. <coughs> now, I think now we no longer need this. OK. So when you have something like this, Function f is calling function g. Now, when you inline g into f, so what can you do? Oh. So if you inline, so now you, you, you're going to copy this and replace it, replace g with the body of g. Constant, uh, in constant propagation? Yeah, exactly. So you can do constant propagation because x equals 5. And if 5 e greater than 100, 5 is not greater than 100, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the if part will not get executed. You will only execute the else part. So if we put some code here, this is A, B, C, and this is D, E, F, 
then we will be executing DEF and returning uh, two. Oh, we are not, uh, okay, so here y equals g of x. So with, with inlining, which is interprocedural, f is going to be x equals 5. And then we are going to execute d e f d e f and then what what should i put here y equals 2 right because if x now if x is 5 this will not get executed we will execute this d e f and it will return 2, and 2 is assigned to y. So y equals 2. So this is possible only if the compiler does interprocedural analysis. If the compiler doesn't do interprocedural analysis, it will not be able to do any of this. Okay. So for here, for h, for example, we can inline g in h, but we will not be able to to eliminate you know, one of these uh, branches or one of these basic blocks. In fact, what we did here is that we eliminated a basic block. So this basic block here got eliminated as a result of constant propagation because x is 5, 5 is always greater than 100. So this condition is always false. And this basic block got eliminated here. But when, when we inline G into H, we're not going to be able to eliminate anything. Why? Because X is variable. You don't know. The compiler cannot predict what it will be at compile time. At runtime. Yeah, at, at compile time, it will not be able to predict what it will be at runtime. So this is something that will be read at runtime. So the compiler doesn't know what X is. So it doesn't know if X is greater than 100 or less than 100. So in this case, it's going to inline it, if it inlines it. It's going to inline it, but there will still be an if-else. Right. It will not be able to eliminate a basic block. That kind of also leads into the optimization you've been kind of dancing around, because that would be <coughs> code elimination. Uh, yeah, so th this is, well, it's, it will not be dead. This is not uh, dead code. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, in fact, it will be unreachable code. So the, the, the term here is, this will be unreachable. So now, con conceptual, what's the difference between unreachable code and dead code? So dead code is code that, uh, well, maybe unreachable is easier. Unreachable code is code that you will never reach under certain conditions. So under these conditions, you will never reach this when you inline, when you call G from F. This code is unreachable code. Uh, but that code is code that is uh, executed, but it's not used later. It's like saying X equals 5 and then never referencing X. So in this case, X is dead code. So it's reachable. You reach it and you execute it, but it's dead because you are defining this and never using it. So this is dead code. This is unreachable code. Okay. Uh, All right. So now, just yeah, just let me emphasize that the compiler is not magic. So if it doesn't do interprocedural analysis, it's not going to detect something like this. And it will not always do this. So if, if it doesn't do interprocedural analysis, it will not do this, what you expect it to do here. So it's not always 
You know, don't expect it to do magic. Okay. One other, one other thing I've noticed is that so the else it actually combined the basic blocks into one larger block. Then. Uh, Yes, well, in fact, we eliminated the branches. Yeah. And when you eliminate the branches, you have larger basic blocks. And larger basic blocks are desirable because uh, they are easier to deal with. You know, branches complicate things. And uh, the less branches, the fewer branches, the easier it will be for, the, for compiler optimization. So uh, working within the basic block is always the easiest thing. You know, like local register allocation. It's easy to work within the basic block and it's harder to work across basic blocks because there are more complexities and uh, restrictions. Okay, any questions? Okay, so I think we have uh, We have covered a good number of optimizations. So let me ask you about inlining. So if you were writing a compiler and trying to decide when to do inlining, of course you will not do inlining for all functions, right? You will not just inline all functions and turn the whole program into just one huge piece of code. Uh, that will not be good. Why not, by the way? Why? Why not? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with just inlining all functions? Why don't we just inline all functions and then uh, our program uh, is a huge main uh, function that has everything in it? What's wrong with this? <coughs> the function would be too large. <laughs> yeah. Or, or the program would be way too large. Yeah, so you are increasing the size of the, you are increasing the size of your program because when you when you uh, define a function, you expect to call this function multiple times. And if you are going to inline it, if this function is getting called a uh, hundred times, then when you inline it, you will have a hundred different copies of that function. So that defeats the purpose of uh, doing structured programming and you know, organizing your program into functions. You organize your program into functions, uh, uh, not only you know, for software engineering and software design reasons that will make it easier to comprehend and easier to uh, analyze and easier to debug, but also you will be saving, when, 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 uh, when you create functions, uh, you greatly reduce the, um, the size of the code. Instead of you know, that function that you call 100 times, it will be, there will be only one copy of that function in memory and then it will be called a hundred times. If you inline it, there will be a hundred different copies of that function. And if that function is large, then that's a huge increase in program size, which means using a huge amount of memory. <coughs> well, so this leads us to the uh, considerations that compilers take into account before deciding uh, when to inline a function. So when is, when is it a good idea to inline a function? In a loop. Okay, so if it's in a loop, so it's a cost benefit, by the way. It's a cost benefit analysis. So it's inlined, a function that is called inside a loop, it's a good idea to inline it from benefit point of view because we will benefit from inlining it in inside the loop because that function call overhead instead of uh, you know, paying that function call cost a thousand times, uh, we are eliminating it. So we are, we are doing a lot of savings. Uh, so from benefit point of view, it's a good idea to eliminate a function that is inside the loop. What else? If the function performs a some kind of mathematical operation, kind of a simpler mathematical operation. Mm -hmm. It just calls a function and 
the only line is return and it does some calculation with the parameters. You can inline something like that. Well, uh, I, maybe you, you are trying to say if the function is small, right? So usually it makes sense to inline a small function. It doesn't make sense to inline a large function. Right? If the function is small, you inline it. But if the function is large, it, it doesn't make sense to inline it. Uh, now this also depends on how many times the function is called, right? So if a function is called 100 times, will it be a good idea to inline it? Probably. Then you'll have 100 copies of that. You'll, you'll have a, uh, an expansion, you'll have an explosion, a code size explosion, if you inline a function that is called many, many times, <coughs> right, statically. So there are a hundred static uh, calls to that function, not dynamically, right? It's, so that by dynamically, I mean if it's, uh, you know, i equals zero, i less than a hundred, i plus plus, and function f. So function f here is called one time, you know, the, the number of static, statically it's called once, dynamically it's called a hundred times. So dynamically it, it will actually get called a hundred times, but statically it's called once. So th this is only one call. Um, so if the static number of calls to that function is large, by inlining it, you will have a, a huge, uh, 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 increase in your code size. So it's not a good idea to call a function, to, to inline a function that is called, um, uh, that is called uh, many times statically. So you inline a function that is small, the body of the function is small, the function is not called uh, very many times, uh, and if, uh, if you do, if you over inline, you will increase the code size. And increasing the code size has negative impact on performance. So what are the negative impacts of increased code size on performance? Yeah. Well. It's something that's caching because because a function can't might because if you have a large number of static calls to a function, the chances are that function's code can might be in the cache. <laughs> you know, if it's called frequently enough. Yeah. So very easy. Whenever you increase the code size, you know, larger code size, it's less likely for. Uh, code to fit in the i cache. We are talking now about the i cache, the instruction cache. Yeah. So it's, you know, this is your program without inlining, and with inlining, you will have, you know, that function here. This function is copied multiple times. So with inlining, this is your code size. So this is the code size without or before inlining. And this is after inlining. So after inlining, the code gets larger. So basically, you want to control the increase in code size. Otherwise, this will have negative consequences on caching. And it will have negative consequences on memory in general, because now your program is bigger, and it will use more memory, uh, more pages, right? Yeah. So that means that. Uh, you know, the, the, this will have a negative impact on performance. We want it, we want our program to be as compact as possible and to use the minimum amount of memory. So we do inlining only when we think it's gonna be beneficial. Uh, and not only inlining, but in general, in compiler optimizations in general, there is a, a cost benefit analysis. So in, uh, in compiler optimizations in general, usually it's hard to tell whether applying a certain optimization is going to be 
helpful or not? Is it going to improve performance or not? So the compiler does a cost-benefit analysis. According to a certain model, it, uh, it quantifies the, the cost of this, uh, of this uh, optimization and the benefit. And it applies the optimization is the benefit if the benefit overweighs the cost. Now, can a compiler do this analysis uh, precisely, or will the compiler always be right? No, it will not always be right. You know, sometimes compilers apply optimizations that degrade performance. It's not uncommon to see something like uh, you compile your program with GCC. Uh, you know, GCC minus O2 uh, program dot C, and then you run the program, and GCC minus uh, O3. So what's minus O2 and minus O3? So these are levels of optimization, right? So. Minus O2 apply level 2 of optimization. Minus O3 apply level 3 of optimization. So what you would expect is that if you apply, and of course there is, you know, minus O1 and minus O0, which is no optimizations. So you have these options. You can control the level of optimization. Now, in theory, what you would expect is that if you apply a higher level of optimization, you will get better performance. But this will not always be the case. So it may happen sometimes that you compile a program at minus O2, and you run it, and the running time is, uh, say, uh, 10 seconds. Then you compile the program at minus O3, and you run it, and you expect something less than 10 seconds, but you get 11 or 12. So this means that sometimes the compiler applies optimizations that degrade performance. Because it's impossible for the compiler to determine if a given optimization is going to really help, it's going to improve performance or not. You know, one example is inlining. It's impossible to, deter, to, to be certain that inlining this function is going to help or is going to hurt. You know, sometimes it's going to make things better, sometimes it's going to make them worse. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it's uh, compiler optimization. Uh, the compiler optimization business is, uh, you know, is, is complicated. And it's, uh, um, it's never certain. You are never certain that a, uh, the optimization that you are applying is going to improve performance. One question. That the certain code patterns couldn't a programmer use pragma instructions to instruct the compiler when not to use a particular optimization if it's not if the programmer knows it's going to degrade performance. Yes, yeah. So there are yeah compilers that use hints from the uh, compilers that use hints from the programmer, uh, but yeah, but these will not always even with those, yeah. you know, the, because the programmer doesn't know what code the compiler is going to generate. So it's a very, uh, very complicated pro uh, process. In general, you know, on average, compiler optimizations improve performance. So on average, you should expect to get you know, a 3x or a 4x performance improvement from a, uh, you know, a compiler like GCC by compiling with a minus O3 optimization level. So your program should run you know, three times, four times, sometimes it's 10 so times faster uh, with compiler optimizations. And it's, you know, you don't expect it when, you know, the difference between O0 and O3 will always be positive. You know, it's, uh, so uh, O3 is always faster than O0. O1, in fact, the, the most benefit you see it when you go from O0 to O1. You see the biggest improvement in, in performance. Then when you go from O1 to O2, it's less improvement. It's not less further improvement, I mean, not less improvement. So if this is, you know, if this, uh, 
you know, this runs in 100 seconds, then when you go to uh, O1, uh, this can be 30 seconds. Then when you go to O2, it may be 40 seconds. And O3 could be 41. Uh, sorry, uh, could be 39 or, uh, you know, 38. But it could be 41. 41 is possible. So it's possible to get worse performance with higher optimization levels.